I'm Ali Jackson Jolly. I'm here with Lan He Chen. He is a fellow with the Hoover Institution. He is also a partner with the Brunswick Group. Lan He, welcome and thanks for being here with us. Sure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you've got a lot of experience thinking about um, the economy and how that impacts policy and American society at large. There's something really interesting going on, and I thought you'd be the right person to talk about that with, and that is that the economy is doing pretty well. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, in 2023, the economy grew by 2.5%. That outpaced the 2002 economy, which um, that same, you know, the U.S. Department of Commerce said grew at 1.9%, and yet Americans don't seem to believe that. You know, many Americans say they are feeling the pinch of this economy. They do not feel like they are living in um, a bullish economy. Why is that? Why can you explain the disconnect there? Well, I think, first of all, for voters, there does tend to be a little bit of a lag between what the economic conditions are showing at a macroeconomic level and how they react from a political perspective. So I, I think some of that lag explains why, for example, although the numbers on inflation and job creation, as you have noted, um, are, are relatively strong, particularly if you look at it from a global perspective, why it is then that voters still feel that their personal economic conditions are not as good. So, so the first thing is this lag. The second thing I would say is that the challenge with something like inflation is it so permeates people's views about the economy. And even though inflation has eased, it's not like we're seeing deflation. It's not like that loaf of bread that was $3, which is now $5, has gone back to being $3. That loaf of bread is still $5. Now, the fact that it's not $5.50 or $6 is something we celebrate. But for voters and for uh, the American people, they still very much feel the impacts of the inflationary pressure we've seen over the last couple of years. So I think that the that the overhang from inflation and the fact that these prices are still elevated to some degree uh, is a challenge. And the last thing I'll say is this, which is even though the labor market is quite healthy, we're also seeing a record number of Americans who are working multiple jobs. And what that tells me is that people are having to work harder to make things work in this economy. Uh, and I do think that that is a real influence on perception and not just a perceived one. So there are many different reasons why I think people have these perspectives and points of view, but there's no question that the public perceptions of the economy uh, are, are a little bit of a mismatch from what we're actually seeing in terms of the macroeconomic data. Yeah, and that's so interesting, that data point you just gave, which is more and more people are having to work two jobs. Um you know, sp talking very specifically to the voting population who may hear politicians talk about a good economy, it feels a little bit like some say going to a doctor and saying, hey, doc, I'm sick. And the doctor saying it's all in your head. And so, you know, that makes me wonder, is there a different indicator that that politicians and frankly policymakers should be talking to the American public about more instead of just hammering home the fact that the economy is growing um, and sort of ignoring the fact that there is, you know, this need to work two jobs, that inflation yeah. still impacts people's ability to live um, to live the life they want to live. You know, Alice, I think it goes beyond. Uh, the question of what the economic measures are telling us. And I think the more that politicians focus on, well, it's a great economy, look at the macroeconomics, the, the more that I think voters feel detached from or disassociated from, uh, from their leaders. And I think that creates the kind of disaffection that creates uh, sentiments of anger or distrust or displeasure in the people who are who are running the country, so to speak. So I, I don't know if there are specific measures that one could point to, because the reality is anytime you have measures, they could be very different from how people are experiencing and feeling the economy personally. And I think it's less about finding the right measures and more about finding, I think, a tone of empathy and understanding about 
how people feel about their personal economic conditions and recognizing that there is a disconnect and that there's work to be done. I think that's something that certainly as we think about um, uh, the current campaign before us and the current political environment uh, is something that politicians would benefit from, saying that there is still work to be done, that while we have made some progress from the significant and, and really punishing inflation we saw a couple of years ago, that th that progress is only part of the way to where we want to be as a country and an economy. Yeah. And then how about, like, I want to go back to that data point again, that more Americans are working more than one job. Um, do you think this is just the way it is sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, those, those different um, indicators, including inflation, but also um, debt, you know, Americans have more debt than before. Is there any unringing this bell or is it sort of like this is what Americans um, have to look forward to working multiple jobs, being a part of like the full time economy, plus the gig economy, that sort mm -hmm. of thing? Uh, great question. I do think the structure of the economy has changed. You know, gone are the days when people had one job for a major corporation and stayed in that job for 25 years. Um, you know, the stories of of people who worked at GM or GE or other places for a long period of time, and 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 that was their life and career. I, I do think it's changed. Uh, I think now what we're experiencing is a situation where you have a gig economy, for example. Uh, you have many more opportunities for people to have multiple side hustles, as it were, and and some of that is the changing nature of our economy. And it's not something to be fretted about or something to, to feel badly about. It's just the reality of our economy. I think the question is really, our, our, it gets to intention and it gets to how people feel. Are they working those multiple jobs because they really enjoy the flexibility to have a lifestyle that allows them to have a lot of different jobs? Or are they doing it because of economic pressure? And that's something that I think we need to dig a little bit further into the sentiment data to understand. Uh, and and create really an environment for the American people to express whether this is a function of a change in the structure of the economy, as you've noted, which is very real. Also, a demographic shift as as the baby boomers retire, the younger generation of workers is used to this sort of multi uh, employment scheme that you might find uh, that that would have been more rare if you went back twenty or thirty years. So we've got to dig into the data. We need a little bit more sentiment information to figure that out. Uh, but I think it's a combination of a lot of different factors. I don't think, Alice, there's, there's any one explanation for why people are working more. But I do think if you ask people why they're working more jobs, you will find a significant number of respondents saying that's what they need to do to, to make a living, to afford housing. Housing costs have, have escalated significantly to afford basic energy uh, in the form of, of home heating, uh, oil or, or uh, gas for their cars. So all of these things are much more pricey now than they were a few years ago. Yeah. And then how about, you know, you mentioned that part of this so-called dissatisfaction or satisfaction recession has to do with the fact that the positive things happening in the economy haven't quite caught up with how we're feeling them. So um, when may more Americans expect to feel, you know, a little more comfortable because what we're seeing with those indicators has finally caught up with us in our real life. Well, look, we have some precedent to guide us in this regard. You know, I um, one of the things I did in my former life is I was the chief policy advisor to Mitt Romney when he ran for president in 2012. And when we first started that campaign in early 2011, the economy was in very difficult shape. Now, the economy gradually improved and then people's sentiment about the economy changed just right in time to get Barack Obama reelected. Uh, so, so that sentiment can take uh, months. It can take a year sometimes. Um, but, but the sentiment does shift to reflect the economic reality that the that the data is showing us to some degree. And so, you know, if you look at the change that happened in 2011 and 2012, that process took you know at least six to nine months, if not longer, for the for the shift in perception to occur. And I think the question for this year's election will be the timing of that shift. And if the economy continues to improve or if it stagnates, if we start to reach a point where we backslide, for example, on inflation, and there's there's some suggestion as we sit here today that the data on inflation are not as favorable as we would like them to be. Um, there are things that are, for example, holding the Federal Reserve off from, from rate cuts. And so those larger macroeconomic factors, I think, uh, suggest an economy that's a little bit more complex than, than maybe the data are telling us right now. 
And so some of that lag I would expect to continue. This is all to say, I don't know exactly when sentiment might shift, but it, but it does take time. Yeah. And then how about, it's a good point about, you know, the Fed holding off on really saying things are good, you know, for about a good part of 2023, many of us heard, you know, those who were watching the economy fearful that there was an actual recession coming. Um, and to what extent do you think that this fear has to, you know, this this American sentiment that things are so bad has to do with that psychological fear for those of us that are old enough to have remembered living through 2008 and how tough that was, um, you know, when when um, when policy leaders start talking about recession, it makes America scared. So is some of this just psychological, do you think? Um, sure. I, there, there's always a psyche to the economy. Uh, you know, we, we, we talk about animal spirits, for example, right. And we, and we talk about uh, the degree to which people are, are feeling, uh, a certain way about, about their, their economic condition. So there's no question that there is a reinforcement between, uh, data and how people feel and then how people feel reinforces that, even though those feelings may be very separate and apart from what the data are telling us. So there's no question that there is a um, a, a psyche component of all of this in terms of how people feel about the economy and also how their neighbors are feeling. By the way, that's one of the factors that's that's um, not as well explored, which is how are people around you living and how does that make you feel? And are you hearing the same stories about not being able to afford certain things? So I, I, I think that you have, again, I think the, the big point of our talk here today is that you have what the data are telling us and then you have what people are telling us. And, and those two are not necessarily connected through anybody's fault. It's just the reality that uh, perception is influenced by by many different factors, not just the not just the data. Yeah, and so we're almost out of time, but you did shout out that you were at one point the policy advisor to uh, presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Um, so if you were um, an advisor to a presidential candidate right now, what would you be advising to them? How would you be telling them to talk about their policy in the economy and how should they be engaging with the American people? Well, I think first of all, recognizing and acknowledging how people feel is important regardless of the data. I think connecting with, with people at that very basic human level is important. Uh, from a policy perspective and how to present the policy, Look, I think Republicans and Democrats uh, will have a very different view of how to address these challenges. And I think what you're hearing from uh, President Biden and a lot of Democrats is that what this demonstrates is the need for more aggressive federal intervention in the economy in a whole host of different areas. And what you're hearing from former President Trump and a lot of Republicans is, no, actually, we need the opposite. We need to look at tax relief and regulatory relief. And and, and those two views of the world are very different um, in, in terms of the best way to proceed. Um, I do think that part of what led to the inflationary pressure we've seen over the last couple of years was this massive fiscal expansion we saw during the tail end of the Trump administration and, and certainly through the, the first part of the Biden administration as well. So unwinding some of that fiscal stimulus, figuring out how to have a more responsible fiscal policy, those are things that I would emphasize and that I would encourage candidates to consider. Uh, but, you know, in this political environment, it's very hard to have a substantive conversation about policy. So. Um, I think if we get there, Alice, I'll be very encouraged because it means we're talking about issues and we're talking about ways of continuing to make the U.S. economy the strongest in the world. Uh, but I think a lot of those policy conversations have gotten subsumed by other things. Yeah, well, I'm sure that this conversation is going to continue on through 2024 up to the election. Um I'm happy to have a strong um, policy voice like yours in this space, making us a little bit smarter about these kind of things. And I hope to continue this conversation going with you in the future. Thank you. Great to be with you.